Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our third Thursday Facebook Live. My name is Gabby, and I am joined here with Bridget Barnes and our special guest, Julie, from the Boys Town Hotline. So, hello. How are you ladies doing? Good. I'm thank you. Great. How are you? Great. Thank you for joining us. We are talking about a very important topic this month because it is Suicide Prevention and Awareness Month. We're going to go over several questions pertaining to suicide prevention, signs that parents can look for, how the Boys Town Hotline can help, and more. So if you are tuning in live and have any questions for Bridget or Julie, as we go through our discussion, please feel free to leave them in the comment section of this video and we can get them answered at the end. So let's hop right in. We are talking both about suicide and self-injury prevention. So we have questions pertaining to both. So our first question here is, what are the most common forms of self-injury so parents can be aware? What we find at the hotline is the most common type is cutting. So teens or young adults using sharp objects that might be knives, scissors, anything that they can use to make cuts on different parts of their body. Might be on their arms, their legs. Um, oftentimes it's underneath clothing, so people can't see it very often. Um, Sometimes kids will burn themselves or bang their heads against a wall, um, pick at their skin. There's just lots of different ways that they um, utilize to hurt themselves. Mm -hmm. Julie, yeah. I have a question that lots of parents in my class ask me. So are there certain age groups are genders that experience self-harm more than others? Do we know that? And, um, but what do we know about these groups? Yes, it, they're definitely, the self-injury ranges, at, you know, all ages, but we have noticed that it is significantly higher in females, you know, in the teens to young adult years. So I think you see that more often but no one is exempt from it. But I would say that is the group to be um, most aware of, of the possibility. Yeah. I think sometimes with guys, maybe they're not reporting it or they're, we're used to seeing scars on guys, so we're not really noticing it as much as parents sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yes, because we do, we have both males and females um, who reach out and they use it as a coping mechanism. Great, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how can parents look for signs of suicidal thoughts or self-injury? There's lots of different risk factors that um, parents can notice. You know, if you see any changes, drastic changes in behaviors. You know, maybe they're not as motivated to be involved in activities that interested them before. Maybe they're isolating themselves, um, not spending as much time with family or friends. And, you know, specifically to self-harm, you know, if they are wearing long sleeves, um, in very warm weather, you know, or maybe they're layering up their bracelets or jewelry on their wrists. Um, and so any change that you notice out of the ordinary as far as their personality would be, could be signs that there might be something wrong and would, we'd encourage you to start that conversation, you know, to check in and see how things are going. Yeah, a mom shared with me like her, she first noticed her kiddo was not wanting to go into the locker room, change clothes because she didn't want to reveal her scars to her peer group. And and then noticing that scars that were continuing to happen in the same place, you know, suspicious looking scar uh, that continued to be, not heal up, it continued to be there. 
Um, and so Julie hit all the important things. And those are just two that I remember this mom who shared with me about her kiddo. Mm -hmm. So if parents suspect that their child is self-harming or is having suicidal thoughts, what are some of the first steps that they should take? Well, I, I think uh, Julie would agree, you know, uh, getting, you know, as much information as possible on self-harm, being informed is a good thing to do and seeking out uh, resources for support is, you know, key, uh, whether that be therapeutic or medications. Uh, go to your first your GP would be, for me, the first stop in talking to people in school uh, talking to the professionals that know and and trying to find as much information so I don't make decisions uh, just based on my gut. Your gut is a good thing, but uh, it's also important to get those supports out there to help you. Would you agree, yeah. Julie? Absolutely. And for any parent, you know, to think that our kids are hurting themselves or, you know, feeling like giving up, that's a hard pill to swallow. And so we have to kind of maintain control of our emotions because we want you to be able to have that conversation. It's not an easy one, but we want you to check in with the child and kind of maintain, you know, those are scary feelings, but um, trying to remain calm and not judgmental because as you gather that information, you want the child to feel comfortable talking to you about it. And as you gather that information, um, then you can determine, is this something that we need to take immediate action on? You know, connect, like Bridget said, connecting with those resources that you have. You know, a good place to start often is with the pediatrician. Mm -hmm. And um, then they can provide additional referrals for counseling, if that's something, you know, to make sure that they can create a safety plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that kind of answers our next question that was left in the comment section. So, Luetta asked if, should she talk to her child if she notices no harm or call a therapist or a client? She said, what's the first step? So, just like Julie just mentioned, probably seeing a pediatrician or what Bridget mentioned, you know, reaching out to a professional is definitely gonna be the best bet. Right. And I like what Julie said about the family is going through it. The child might be cutting themselves, but everybody's, you know, affected by this. And so family therapy might be in order. Of course, getting the child maybe some cognitive behavioral therapy or uh, dialectic behavioral therapy might be good, but talking to some professional who specializes, of course, in that. And some parents have said to me, and I know Julie have heard this, but that they're concerned about putting kids on medication, you know, uh, about placing children on medication. And sometimes it's called for depending on what's going on with the child and after that, after that assessment is done. But I ask parents to, you know, kind of, you know, they should consider everything. Don't place anything off the table when it comes to their child's safety. So uh, they'll want to make sure they have all the information before just saying no to anything. And that includes medication. Yeah, because no one treatment is going to work for every person. It's you want to treat that child as an individual and what may work for them may not work for somebody else. So just taking the time to fully assess the situation so that they get the care that they need. And sometimes it may just be you asking that question and having the conversation with it, opening that door. Um, so just asking can have a positive impact on that child. Definitely. So Julie, to build on that, what has the hotline been seeing recently in relation to suicidal thoughts and self-injury. 
Have you seen an increase in those types of calls because of the pandemic and uncertain state of this last year and a half we've been living? Yes, we definitely have seen some shifts. Um, the hotline has remained pretty steady. You know, our calls are consistently coming in and um, we've definitely seen an increase in anxiety, mm -hmm. um, teens expressing loneliness and feeling isolated, and an increase in their conflicts with parents. And each of those three things make perfect sense given what we've been through in the last couple of years. You know, that um, spending lots more time with family and not so much time with friends and at school. So we have definitely seen that shift. And each of those things I mentioned could be risk factors for suicide. Um, so on, gosh, 95% of the calls that we receive at the hotline, they may not call about suicide specifically, but based on some of those risk factors that we hear as we're conversing with the person, we will check in and ask with everything going on, is it, are they thinking about suicide? Um, and I know, you know, as you ask that question, it reminds me that I definitely have seen an increase in the number of parents calling the hotline on behalf of their child and young children, you know, eight to 10, eight to 11 years old who are having thoughts of hurting themselves. And, you know, they have seen our number, they know it's a safe place that they can call. So they actually initiate the contact. So our crisis counselors can talk to the youth about what's going on and just talk about their coping skills. And, you know, we'll get into it, but we have our website, yourlifeyourvoice.org, that is an excellent um, resource for teens and young adults who are experiencing thoughts of suicide or self-injury. Right. Yeah, and we always, you know, talk about the importance of having your child save the Boys Town hotline to their phone number, but a lot of these younger kids, you know, might not, not have a phone yet, so that's why we definitely want to encourage all parents watching, too, to have that number in their contacts or, you know, on a magnet, on the fridge, just somewhere readily available. So even if they don't have a phone and are younger, like Julie said, they can still reach out for help and call. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bridget, are you kind of hearing the same thing from your comments and experiences of parents saying that they're yeah, parents uh, and children during this pandemic are feeling a lot of anxiety and stress. <laughs> I mean, and who wouldn't, right? So, exactly. And so a child who might be even more sensitive to that uh, really are in a difficult spot because now we are stuck in our homes or, you know, a lot less able to maybe even get some of the resources. So having something like the hotline, someone there 24 seven that can, you know, talk to you through it, or your life, your voice for your kid to be able to get that ongoing support is so key. And we put it in every one of our packets that we give to parents through our online parenting classes, because we know how that, how much it means just to have someone else there for you when you need to talk to them. Yeah. Definitely. And we have that resource linked here in the comment section. We have Your Life, Your Voice, our website, and the hotline listed. But like Julie said, we can get into that more in a little bit on how exactly the hotline can help. So, okay. The next question is for children who are struggling with grief, anxiety, or depression, how can we as parents provide healthy coping methods so they don't turn to suicide or self-injury? Well, if I can say when my family went through a, a loss, a grief, and I really did have to um, learn a lot about, you know, self-injury and suicide ideation and um, because uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding and confusion around this particular um, disorder. And so you want to make sure you really understand so that you can better support your kiddo. 
Uh, and as I said earlier, get the right support and never respond to your child who's harming themselves with anger or judgment. It's important, uh, you know, a lot of parents think that their kids are hurting themselves because of their poor parenting. And I really strongly suggest to them to focus on the child at this point so that you can really connect with them so you can be able to help them. We're charged with as parents, our great duty here with a child who's struggling is to give them a safe environment and consistent support and the opportunity to develop the skills they need to be able to navigate through their emotions and their anxieties. So I think it's really important for us to, when parents say, well, what can I say, Bridget? What can I say? And I say, the best thing is to say less and listen more. Mm-hmm. in order to you know, help your kiddo. And then when you don't have the answer, be okay saying, I don't know, but I'm gonna find out, I'm gonna call the hotline, I'm gonna go to class, mm-hmm. I'm gonna you know, get that help for you. And so you're not alone. You're not alone is, is what I tell parents, we're here for you. So Julie, what makes the Boys Town Hotline unique in its ability to help at-risk youth? Oh, where do I begin? I mean, it is just such an awesome resource. I mean, even preparing for this today, you know, I pulled up the website and started reading through the self-injury and suicide sections on the questions and answers and the tips and tools. And really, you can just, as a parent, once you start reading those, you can find yourself, you know, just kind of lost, you know, for 40 minutes to an hour. And it's just so helpful. And so as adults, as we do that, imagine if the teens get on there, you know, they're experiencing this and it's a safe place they can access 24-7. So maybe they're not ready to call to talk to somebody about it. The Your Life, Your Voice website is just an easy way for them at their with their own control, at their own leisure to start gathering information. And one piece of our website is our question and answer section. So those are real emails that we've received at the hotline from teens. Mm-hmm. And we have them divided by category. So if somebody's struggling with a relationship, they click on that category, they start reading some of those emails they may come across a situation very similar to theirs and they can read the counselor's response. So without even picking up the phone, they're finding ways that they can maybe handle a situation in a healthy and positive way. Um, So that's one way it's accessible 24 seven. We know we started the hotline 30 over 30 years ago as a crisis hotline. Over those 30 years, technology has changed. So we definitely saw a decrease in the number of teens and young adults who were actually picking up the phone to call and talk. So we knew we had to be creative and find ways that they were comfortable. So the website was one way. And then we also have a texting service because we know our teens are connected to um, their electronics and their phones. And it's just a way that some are more comfortable communicating. So we have counselors who are using the tech service 24 seven to connect with teens and young adults to help them with any crisis situation they might be going through. And what's nice is when you reach out to the hotline, you're gonna get objective guidance. You know, the counselor doesn't know you, they don't know your family, they don't have any preconceived ideas or opinions on what should happen. The whole conversation is focused on the person's thoughts, feelings, and ideas. Our whole goal is to empower them to change their situation in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just as Julie mentioned, there are so many tips and tools on there. It would take us all day to kind of go through and explain some of them, but um, off the top of your head, Julie, what are some of the great tools that some of the kids can find on the Your Life, Your Voice? I know we have well, like the coping toolbox and a safety plan, just to name a few, but what else is there? Well, because we're talking about self injury and suicide, I think that self, um, the safety plan is key. Yeah. You know, so I encourage parents listening to pull that up or youth who are listening and use that. 
the whole point of that is at a neutral time, maybe you're not in crisis mode, that you take time and fill that out together. And it just identifies triggers to the negative feelings, coping skills, supportive people, reasons for living. But if they do that at a neutral time, because we all know when we're in crisis, we're focused on the negative and we feel so alone, we feel like there are no options, that no one cares about us. Having that safety plan in a safe place, you can pull it out and it just reminds you, it helps ground you that, no, I do have people who care about me. These are my coping skills. So we have a list of 99 positive coping skills. That's another popular tool. Um, 101 positive um, comments about myself. So those are uh, riding the wave. There's just tons of tips that um, a hope box, you know, sometimes when we feel discouraged, we lose that hope, but a hope box is something that a team can put together to remind them of the important things in their life, kind of similar to that safety plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and these are great tools to put together as a family and can really break down some of the barriers that your child might have. So when you're sitting with them and saying, you know, hey, let's let's put together this hope box and let's talk about, you know, what gives you hope? How are you feeling lately? You can really open the door to see we know that suicide prevention and three so that's why you're like provide these resources to make it easier to bring it to Okay. So we have one last question and it's kind of a loaded question. So for both of you, Bridget and Julie, I would like to know what do you think is the most important thing parents should know during suicide prevention month? Well, I will say that um, it's important for parents to know that uh, there's, there's triggers in their stressors that their kid is probably experiencing and trying to connect and communicate with their kids ahead of time about what those triggers are so they can make a plan for it. Don't wait until you're in the situation or after it's over. Try to be more proactive about your parenting as much as you possibly can. To teach your children some alternatives to their negative thinking, negative feeling, negative behavior. And then uh, finding them the proper support uh, is important, you know, so that they are around more positive uh, uh, people, even yourself, like you were saying earlier, Gabby and Julie, if you create if you create a praise box where you're praising your kid more and they have this hope box where they're using more self affirmation, I think maybe your house will be a little bit more positive and that will help kids with that kind of negative thinking and negative feeling, right? And yeah, just don't forget this, moms and dads. You have to support yourself too, you know. Uh, you know those saying, when mama's happy, everybody's happy. The same thing applies here. When you're feeling good, especially, you know, you have to take care of yourself so you can take care of your kids. So do something nice for yourself so that you can be able to help your child who's struggling. Julie, what do you think? I think it's important, too, to remember that these teenage years are tough. I mean, we all survived them, um, but it is tough. And then add the last two years to it yeah. that um, it's don't be surprised if your child struggles. And given this discussion, you know, if you're concerned that they might be using self injury to cope or they might be having thoughts of suicide, don't be afraid to ask. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be a touchy subject. You might be afraid you don't want to give the idea by asking the question, but. We encourage people to not beat around the bush, ask directly, you know, I'm worried that you're thinking about ending your life, are you? Um, or are you having thoughts of suicide? Because what we have found at the hotline is if you ask directly, they'll answer directly. And um, so I guess if you're concerned, don't be afraid to ask. Definitely. And, you know, providing those resources, like I mentioned, and 
keeping them in an open place so they can visit yourlifeyourvoice.org or they can call the hotline directly at 800-448-3000 or they can text voice to 20121. So I'll make sure to leave all of that in the comment section as well as the other resources we discussed so you can access them. But Bridget and Julie, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for talking about this difficult topic. I know that it provides a lot of comfort for many parents this month, and I really appreciate it. Well, thank you Thanks, for having Gail. us. Yes. <laughs> thank you to everyone watching, and we hope you have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you next month. Bye-bye.